Uh, as Todd mentioned that my, my name is Kubachan and today's topic is about how to use AI to fight fraud, fraud waste and abuse. And first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, besides I am a, uh, the CTO of a small company named Index Analytics, I'm also the board of directors for Linux Foundation ODPI. And, uh, and so like Linux Foundation, just like the other community, open source community, uh, they, are, they have different projects. And uh, ODPI is the data arm of our Linux Foundation. Uh, we, uh, we have projects about uh, BI and AI, which is actually the one that I'm chair with, and also uh, Igeria, which is the related to the ma uh, mass metadata, and also the Open Data Science for All. It uh, create a curriculum so that the, uh, the other university or community college, if they uh, don't have the resource, they can actually pull down the resource from this community and uh, try to teach AI and machine learning data science to, uh, to their student. So those are the three main projects. But as we are talking now today, we are actually thinking to combining with LFAI, which is the AI community. And uh, in one of my uh, YouTube channel, you, I, I explained that data is like the ingredients of cooking a dish while the, um, uh, the, the, the recipe is the AI algorithm. So I think this is a very perfect match if we join these two community together, the OD ODPI and also uh, LFAI. So in the next few weeks or so, you should be able to see some uh, announcement from Linux Foundation that these two communities are, are joined force to create a bigger impact on the analytics industry. So that's me, but before I move on, let me give you this disclaimer. Disclaimer, this presentation session was prepared or accomplished by Cupid Chan in his personal capacity. The opinions expressed in this talk are the author's own and do not reflect the view of any United States government agency or department. Okay, because of my role in the project, so I have to put this disclaimer uh, to you. So I hope you got it, okay? So real things really start, but let me share with you a story. This is actually a real story when I prepared this, uh, how to use AI to uh, fight the fraud, waste and abuse. One night when I preparing this uh, talk, I received a LinkedIn request from someone called Jacqueline Moss. I really do not know who is she, but uh, you know what? Usually when uh, someone invite me in LinkedIn, I would just accept it. Uh, unlike Facebook, LinkedIn is more professional, so I just trust this uh, system. But by the time I received that uh, invitation, she starts sending me message. And at first, it's very usual, casual. It's just saying hello, introduce herself. And out of courtesy, of course, I will reply, welcome to LinkedIn, Jacqueline, and let's keep in touch. But she started uh, uh, doing something even like uh, uh, funnier because she introduced herself as an investor and uh, also from Washington, D.C. and uh, currently is in, Virginia, in, in Virginia and is the founders of like, American candy company Mars Incorporated. You know what? I also live in Virginia, so mm -hmm. I reply saying, yes, I am a Virginian too. Nice to meet you. But then she keeps on going saying that, what do you do? Okay, I am, uh, I have organization to leverage data and use AI and analytics. So for example, to uh, prevent fraud, waste and abuse. Oh, interesting, she replied. And I would like you to share with me some exclusive, exclusive about yourself and what do you do in your industry? What like a potential you have and how profitable it is. And I'm seeking invest in a private organization, government organization, and even individual. That's why I am a businesswoman and rated worldwide. Okay, that really raised some red flag. But you know what? I, Again, out of courtesy, I just asked more clarification question. By exclusive, what do you mean? Her reply, it's very interesting. Her reply is, yes, exactly. So you know what? That really gives me a red flag. Is this something that I should be aware or she is legitimate? 
I will continue this LinkedIn story in the uh, in later of this uh, conversation or this conference talk. But back to the question, back to the title of this talk is "Catch Me If You Can." I am actually inspired by a movie, so I know that we have the chat um, uh, uh, function enabled. So. If you have seen this movie, may, maybe you can uh, let me know so that like I, I know if, if some of you have already seen that, you have some background about, about this. So let me see if I can see your chat. Did I, uh, yeah, I have some. Okay, so yep, yep, some, yep. At, at least five years, I think it's even longer. Yes, this is, this is the movie uh, of like act by, Leonardo DiCaprio, and of course, in the movie, it basically he is, he is portrayed as, um, uh, as a guy who never went to the uh, flight school, but he was a pilot. And he never went to a medical school, but he can do it as a doctor. And also, he never went to a law school, but he also can do uh, the job of a lawyer. But of course, as you know that, in, as in any movie, if you have a bad guy here, you will have a good guy. The good guy is Tom Hanks. He's the detective, he's the police, trying to catch Leonardo. Like uh, his name actually is Frank Abenow and uh, Tom Hanks' name is, is Carl in the movie. And they just try to like uh, give some strategy. How can I catch you? And on the other side, how can I avoid you? That makes me think, okay, this is a very good topic because in AI, can we use the AI to really get this kind of games going on to catch fraud rates and abuse? But before we move on, we need to be very clear about what is fraud, waste and abuse. So the definition is like that. When you're doing a fraud, that means there are laws here, there are rules here, and you intentionally try to break it. Intentional deception. That's basically a fraud is. Abuse is a little bit of blur because it's not really you break the rule, but you bend the rules. So maybe you're not breaking the law, but you're, you're abusing the law to give you, instead of like the, the flexibility or the convenience to the uh, fellow citizens, you take the advantage of the law and bend it. That's abuse. And when we go to waste, it's even the, the, the line, it's even not clear because when you think about waste, uh, you or some husbands may, may say, the wife is uh, like, uh, you, you have only one mouth. How come you can get like uh, 50 different lipsticks of different colors, even if you have a mouth, one mouth only? It's a waste. But on the other hand, the, the, the wife may also accuse the husband is a waste. You only have a pair of hands. How come you can like keep, keep purchasing the game controllers, right? So it's a little bit blurry, but in, uh, in uh, summary, anything that is not used in efficiently, like that's a waste. Error on the other hand is another level lower. It's basically an intention, unintentional thought. For example, if I type in my uh, name with a typo uh, or like a, a day, of, day of birth with a typo, that is not intentional. It's just simply an error, not really a fraud, right? So if, if you understand all this, fraud, waste and abuse is actually happened here in the real world. You should also know that people are trying to get some way to, to get around all that. So some, some say, like actually this is based on uh, Forbes uh, last year, there, there was a survey uh, conducted by Forbes that majority of the companies or organization aware of that and they have already done something, for example, to do the anomaly detection. This is the blue line here is something that they have already done. And the yellow, the yellow line here is something that they plan to adopt in the one, uh, one, next one or two years. As you can see here, it, the, using artificial intelligence or machine learning is actually one of the most popular ones that they plan to adopt here in, in the next one or two years. 
So you know that this is something coming up. But let me ask you a question. You know that there are different forms of uh, fraud, waste, and abuse. Credit, credit card fraud, healthcare, or just to steal your identity. Can you take a guess out of the three, which one caused us much like uh, the most money of all? So like, again, you can use the chat windows to uh, provide your answer out of, out of the three. Which one do you think is uh, causing the most money? Is that something that identity theft or credit card fraud or healthcare? Okay, okay. People are saying identity theft, okay. So healthcare, let me review the answer. The answer is healthcare fraud. It's $68 billion per year estimated. And the uh, credit card fraud rank, the second is 21.7 uh, billion. And identity of, of uh, fraud, even though it's a lot of money, but it's only $1.7 billion. So with that in mind, within the United States, there is one organization that has a lot of healthcare budget, which is CMS, Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services. And just for the fiscal year of 2018, their budget is more than $1 trillion. With that, and when I compare that to the GDP of the countries around the world, it's actually one agency rank about 17 if you are compared to the other country around the world. And no surprise because of that. So uh, the bad guy are laying their eyes on how to get some or portion of this money in their pocket. So that's why back uh, a few years back, we do have some news from ABC that to be estimated approximately $60 billion was like a used impro improperly in fraud ways or, or, or abuse. So this is actually a big number, a big amount of money. But when we think about the business problem, we have it now. How are we going to deal with that? Just like what I have mentioned in the beginning of this conference, if you want to do the AI, you need both ingredient, which is the data and also the recipe, which is the AI piece. But where are we going to find the data? If you think about this, they, this kind of data would not be very easy to get. Uh, people would not just publish their uh, proprietary, proprietary data and saying that, hey, uh, you know what, this kind of uh, uh, information, you can use it as a fraud. But fortunately, there are actually some uh, open data sets. That's why this conference is all things open, right? Not only the algorithm is open, the data is also open for you to, to adopt and run your algorithm. And one, one data set is Medicare provider utilization and payment data with the physician and other suppliers that uh, here in the, uh, in the website here I listed, it's free for you to download. And right now, they do have the data ranges from 2012 to 2017. And when I download all the data and I list it out uh, year by year, you can actually see that there are a lot of features that I can do. But the problem is the feature is not the same across all the years. So some of them are actually missing out in the other years. So for example, in 2012 and 2013, the uh, standard deviation are there, but they no longer uh, happens in 2014 to 2017. And at the same time, yeah, when you look at 2014 to 2017, there are some standard payment, it's there, but uh, it back then in 2012 to 13, it's not there. But when we are going to train a model, we want something that can be more standardized, not only standardized, but at the same time, we want to pull the one that is more meaningful to uh, come up with as a feature. For example, you do not want to uh, like a, a set 
the last name or first name as the feature because you know most of the time that will not uh, impact any uh, model that you're going to build. So that's why after like uh, analyze the data set, these are the data or these are the features that we are going to pull out to do that initial analysis. If you look at this closer, you will notice that all these features are good, but it's still missing something. That is, which line here are fraud? Hence, we need to bring out another data set, which is the list of excluded individuals and entities. And it is published by the Office of Inspector General. Basically, what it means is like after like years or months of investigation, they identify some persons. Those are the bad guy who are proven to be guilty in their practice. So that's the reason why they list out and publish this list to uh, on their website. Again, you can download it, and then by combining the NPI, which is the National Provider Identifier, with the previous data set, then I can identify who is the bad guy. And one thing that you need to uh, like uh, take a look, closer look here is they are not only publish who, who are the bad guys, but at the same time, they also publish what kind of terms that they violate and for how long they need to be in this excluded list. For example, in 1128A, they are just excluded for five years. That means if this same person is going to conduct or charge any Medicare data, any Medi Medicare claims within that five period of time, of obviously that would become a fraud, a fraud, fraudulent case. And when you are looking at this LEIA database, you will find out something even more interesting because even though they publish that uh, data, that sets of data, not all the lines or not all the rows have an MPI. In fact, 90% of the MPI are missing. So that actually makes the combination, the blending of these two data sets harder. So we need to take a closer look when we are trying to blend the data. And here is the algorithm, here is the logic when we are trying to combine these two, uh, two data sets. As I mentioned, 2012 to 2017, those are the six years that we have the data off. And then by the LEIE data set, we know that from which day, starting from which day, uh, this, this uh, person or this doctor or provider start to be excluded from uh, uh, claiming or charging any Medicare, Medicare claims. And then at certain day, this uh, uh, period will end. So we lock down this period, but I do one more step. I go back one more year because I feel like if you are being accused or being like verified, proven guilty in 2014, for example, so before 2014, let's say a year of, of time, you have already started something that will make you to this conclusion. So that's why between one year before the excluded day started to the final day that exclusion ends, I would consider that as a fraud period. And then all the HCPEX calls, meaning that all the operations and services provided by this provider, I consider that as fraud. So when I combine that together, I come up with this uh, final data structure. All, all the uh, features in the top uh, five or, or eight features, they are the features for that. And the last one is actually the label that I deduced from the logic that I explained it to you earlier in the previous slide. Now, let's the fun, let's the fun part uh, started because we are going to build a model using supervised learning. But one thing I want to tell you, based on my experience in AI, I guarantee you, I can build a model with 99% of accuracies. So in this conference, I am exposing this secret to you the very first time, how to build this 99% accuracy model. You know what is that? I'm going to predict everything is not going to be a fraud. 
if you take a look at the confusion matrix here, all the accuracy is based on the total number of observations. And then the numerator is the total number of correct prediction that I can make. That is the accuracy. But when you look at the total number of observations that I have right here, it is actually 54 million as the total number of uh, cases. And out of them, only 4,600 or 4,700 of them. So it's less than 0 0.008, like around 0.009% of that. So if I make my model to predict everything and anything to be non-fraud, the accuracy of my model will be more than 99%. But is this really something that you want? I bet not, right? Because you want to find fraud. It doesn't matter whether how accurate this model is, accuracy is not the only reason, it's not the only determination why we need to build such model. So we come up with the problem and this problem is imbalance of the data. We have a lot, a way lot more of one class of the data versus the other class. In this case, we have a way more non-fraud normal data versus just a very tiny portion of the fraud data. So how are we going to deal with that? It's actually not really a abnormal problem. Credit card fraud or uh, when you're manufacturing something, the defect on the, on the product that you are trying to manufacture or some rare disease, when you try to diagnose some rare disease or natural disaster, these actually are the very good scenarios to reflect the discrimination of the data of the minority class. But we do have some solutions to, to deal with that. One is we decrease the majority of that. So in this case, we can reduce the non-fraud cases by using random undersampling. That's one, one potential uh, solution to deal with that. And the other solution you can imagine is to increase the minority by maybe I just randomly replicate the minority observation so that when I train my model, that would be more uh, a minority representation for that. Or I can synthesize, I can produce some synthetic minority uh, uh, observations to basically uh, uh, like uh, complement what I have in the majority group. So with these two approaches, can you guess which one I should pick in this particular situation? Again, feel free to use the chat windows, but I'm going to reveal my secret to you. The real like uh, solution for this case is I'm going to use the random undersampling, the RUS. Why? Because if you take a look at that, if I have already got 54 million observations for the normal cases, if I expand my fraudulent case so that it would be more balanced, that would be a huge amount of data for me to, uh, to take care of. So that's the reason why I try not to keep increasing the fraudulent case by either replicated or trying to synthesize that fraudulent case, but instead, I cut down, I trim down the number of observation in the normal cases so that it would be more balanced. Or uh, like you may ask, like what would be the right proportion? It can be 50-50s, 40-60, 30 70 or 20-80, it doesn't matter. The, the whole idea here is I want to make sure that when I provide the, uh, the training sample for my model, it will be at a point that it will not be too biased or too unbalanced of the data that you always predict the normal case is the uh, uh, predicted result. So I put everything together in TensorFlow. I use TensorFlow uh, to be more specific. I use the boosted tree classifier and I use the 50-50 class distribution for that. Look at that. The accuracy that I got, it's about 76, 76%. And the recall is 85%.
AUC is 84%. Yes, accuracy is not as good as 99%, which I predict everything to be like a non-fraud. Non but 76% of the accuracy plus uh, precision, pre precision about 70%, and the record about 85% is actually pretty good uh, when we are considering the number of sample that we have. But boosted tree classifier is not the only model that we have. How about the other models? For example, decision tree, uh, logistic regression, or support vector machines. Those are also very commonly used model, right? So, by this, actually, some of the scholar in Florida Atlantic University have also done a very similar study. And what they did is they used different learner or the model to try to come up with different score, AUC, the uh, false negative and false positive rate for that. As you can see, out of them all, the like uh, the uh, uh, four point five decision tree actually are uh, uh, the best model among all because they have a pretty decent AUC rate and also very relatively low false negative rate. But there is a caveat here: uh, they're not using the full uh, six years because uh, when they did this research is like uh, two 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 or three years back, so they don't have the um, two thousand seventeen uh, data. So they only use the years of 2012 to 2015 and contains approximately $37 million versus uh, like a 54 million as I use in my data set. And also they did not use the looking back one year, which I assume the activities when you are going to do, uh, have a fraud in certain year, one year before that, you start doing something funky. So that's why I incorporate that. But in this study, they did not include that one year look back. But you can see the, the whole idea of this and the result is pretty comparable to what we have found by using uh, the approach that I suggested to you earlier, All right? So what, like when we are talking about a fraud detection system, I think one thing that we need to uh, be sure is we need to make sure that we're not missing substantial number of the fraudulent case, which again, if I uh, predict 99% of the cases are non-fraud, which totally missed this point. But on the other hand, we do not want to produce too many false positive. Otherwise, it's, otherwise it would be too, too uh, annoying by uh, keep on uh, uh, like, uh, pointing a finger saying that, hey, this is a fraud. So a good balance would be if you have a relatively low uh, false negative rate and reasonably low false positive rate, it's actually pretty desirable. And this is what, like, uh, what we have already done in this supervised learning. Of course, there are some potential um, uh, improvement that we can do for this. For example, the geographic information in the original data set, I dropped it, I did not use it. But in the future, we may also want to take a look at the geospatial or geographic information. Also, like uh, I include the provider side of the data, but how about the beneficiary, the patient side? We did not have it. So in the future, in a, a, as, a, as an improvement, so we can also incorporate that. Another way to improve our model or our AI algorithm even more <clears throat> is to have more granular data by different times, pick, pick, scroll. But it actually depends if we only have a small set of data and if we even subdivide it into different pick, pick, scroll or operation that may or may not help for the model. So we need to really test it out whether we want to go um, of more granular level or not. And of course, we can also include more make, uh, metrics here to see whether we can produce more pre, uh, precise results. And finally, remember that I also uh, mentioned in the LEIE database, there are a lot of more than 90% of the missing MPI data. But what if we can combine with another data set, let's say the MPES registry, to 
uh, boost up the to boost up the MPI, the missing MPI by matching up this MPS registry. That actually will be another way to enhance the whole algorithm more when, when we do that. So even though those improvements may actually help out in the supervised learning, but there are still some limitation that we need to take, uh, well, be aware of. As the, as the nature of supervised learning is you need to create a, a tag or label along with each observations. But remember that tagged data is not always be available. In fact, we did not, when I introduced you for these two data sets, it's actually not there. We just try to correlate and create our own tag, but that may not be as accurate. So tag data is not always be available is uh, one of the limitation for supervised learning. And another one is when we tag, when we rely on the tag data, it's basically something happened in the past. But if you think about anomaly or uh, some fraudulent cases, usually those bad guys are trying to create innovatively and creatively. Think about a new pattern to cheat the system. If we're relying on some historical data on the tag data on uh, something in the past, that may not be sufficient enough if we try to move on to detect the new emerging trend. And that's the reason why another way of unsupervised learning comes. Just like in this diagram, if I don't tell you anything, if I don't tell you anything, but just throw you a, a bunch of paper clip, can you spot something? Of course, your answer should be yes. I can spot right here. This is the yellow paper clip I can easily observe. Of course, on a diagram like that, it's pretty obvious. In supervised learning, we are trying to transform the data from something that is like this, which is very hard if I ask you to spot where is the uh, anomaly or where is the outlier of this data set. But in supervised learning, we basically transform the data into something that I can or the algorithm can spot the outlier right here. In this case, it's easier because I just plot one feature against the other, the two dimension in a 2D graph, then I can spot the outlier right away. But what if I have something like this? We can then cluster, use unsupervised learning to cluster different things. And by, by coloring different cluster or different category, I can then focus more on the one, on the group that, that potentially have more fraudulent case or exceptional case compared to the other part of the population. And when I look at this, I always think of this picture. This picture, when I see it, I do not know what is that, but please pay attention to the next 30 seconds. This may look like just a jumble of old painted plastic and wire, but when you take a step back, you see it for what it really is. A remarkable sculpture suspended in mid-air. Yes, I, when I uh, saw this uh, YouTube video, I immediately link this back to unsupervised learning. Sometimes when you look at the data, it's just scattering around. You don't have a way or you don't have a clue. What is that? What is the pattern? What is the anomaly? And how am I going to categorize them? But the beauty for super, unsupervised learning is, I don't need to tell you. I do not need to tell you what to look for. You just maybe step back, step forward, or looking at from the other angle. And then immediately, or, or, or after a while, you will be able to spot the pattern. This pattern at certain angle, in certain line, uh, 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 level, and then spot at certain things, you will see that pattern start to emerge. And here in unsupervised learning, a more like a mathematical way is there are two approaches for more statistical mathematical way to define unsupervised learning in AI. In this particular case, 
as you can see in my uh, screen, there are uh, two groups of blue dots here, but there are three dots, P1, P2, and P3 here. Using your chat function, tell me which one do you think it's called outlier or anomaly in this case, okay? So you can say P1, P2, or P3. If you are the one that is trying, that, that they're trying to categorize P1, P2, or P3, which one do you think is an outlier for that? Okay, someone answer it. Okay, P1, of course. Yep, a lot of people are saying P1. Good, good. But actually P1 is a very, uh, very good answer by using nearest neighbor approach. This, what, this approach is by measuring the distance, the distance between the closest points of them. When you're measuring the distance of this, you know that the, the closest point is here, it's relatively, relatively short compared to P1 right here, right? So obviously P1 will be considered as outlier, but when you are using another approach, density, based approach. It's by density. Both P1 and P2 are also can be considered as an outlier because you can see that everything here are very close, but P2 are just like a, a, not as close, not as dense compared to the other blue dot. But when you look at P3, the, the distance, even though it's, it's uh, uh, not as uh, good, but the density, it's actually pretty uh, similar to the other blue dot here. So P3 here can also consider as part of this cluster. P1, obviously it's very non-dense in, in this position. So that's the reason why, depending on whether you're using nearest neighbor and N or when you're using uh, density. So that will basically, cons uh, a different approach will can consider as different things for you to get the um, uh, uh, unsupervised learning as an anomaly, right? So now let's come to the very last approach that I want to talk to you in this, uh, in this conference. But I also want you to use the chat windows to tell me this person, this person, you must know her in order to understand the third approach. Who is she? A is she committed a 100 million fraud in European bank last year by just guessing at the mean password using an AI algorithm. A. B is like, she is actually a man dressed in disguise to fool the airport security to smuggling five kilogram of drug in United States last year. And C, she is actually the person inventing this third approach that I'm going to introduce. So use your chat windows and see whether you can uh, guess who is this person, all right? So I got uh, some answer coming in and most of them are C and some say all three. And the answer is actually none of them, none of them. This person, I said it's related to uh, this third approach, but she is actually fake. She is produced by an approach that I'm going to introduce called GANG, Generative Adversarial Networks. So in this network, what happened is a generator is trying to learn some real samples from real world and then try to generate some fake sample so that the discriminator is trying to guess whether is this, uh, is this a real sample or is this something from generator? If the result is coming back, the uh, discriminator is correct, then the discriminator will be kept, but the generator would pick up this clue to improve its skill to fake more samples. On the other hand, if the uh, the discriminator is incorrect, then it will also pick up the clue. So next time it will know, oh, this kind of uh, sample is actually fake. When we apply this to like uh, producing a fake image, we can provide a lot of uh, real gener genuine image to the generator. So the generator keep on producing this. 
so that the, the picture that you saw in the previous slide, this, that lady here, it's actually a result of GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network uh, uh, Algorithm. So in real world, we're actually doing this by uh, uh, getting that healthy data set so that the gang will keep on learning and try to understand what is good and what is bad. And then by the time when the real bad, like in this case, a cancer cells comes in, then it would detect immediately because it knows what is good and what is bad. But you may ask, hey, Cupid, hold on one second. I think this topic is about how to use AI to fight fraud, fraud waste and abuse. Why you suddenly change the topic for image like uh, uh, pr production or, or just image uh, 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 reproduction for that. Yes, look at this. If I change the generator and the discrimi discriminator to Leonardo and Tom Hanks here, and then if I change the image to something like the maybe the correct or normal healthcare fraud data, but, but without fraud, and then the, the fuller or the generator will try to generate some sample so that the uh, uh, discriminator will try to detect whether it's a fake or real. Then this model, it's actually a very good model to detect whether the data coming in is fraud or not fraud. And if I plot it graphically, this is actually the graphic. The blue cross here is the real genuine data with, with no fraud. And I, I got the five minutes uh, uh, alert. Thank you very much. And I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, here, when in the gen uh, generic uh, way of having all this data to, to pretend I am the, the real data, the, or the orange triangle is going to do this, trying to fool the discriminator so that when it comes be becoming better and better, the discriminator, the, the generator will try to produce the orange triangle. And at the same time, the discriminator will try to distinguish uh, between the good and the bad. But there is a problem. The problem here is when the generator or the fuller becomes so good that it produces more and more orange triangle, the, the, the fake, sample around this area, the discriminator will no longer be able to distinguish that. So that's the reason why we need a, another way, which is actually one of the study of OCAN, uh, One Class Adversarial Nets, by these five scholars. So what they're doing is instead of faking the real thing right here, they are faking the gap right here so that the, the discriminator will try to distinguish whether this is the gap or this is something real for, for the, from the real data set. That's the complementary game that will help out to distinguish between the fraud and the, uh, and the true data. And in fact, by using this architecture, the, the, uh, the approach and the results are very sounding. They, they detect a lot more than the traditional gang to uh, distinguish whether this is a fraud case versus this is not. And uh, I understand that uh, we, I don't have much time left, so I want to uh, give you the uh, advantage of the one class adversarial net or the one can. It is, you do not need much fraud data. You actually do, you don't need the, the fraud data to start with, which in the supervised learning that I showed you before, we spend some time to do the class balance. And at the same time, discriminator here can be more efficient because it's not trying to distinguish between the real data and the fake uh, 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 normal data. It's trying to differentiate the real data from the generator malicious data. So it's more efficient, efficient that way. And for this model, it adapt much better to the emerged normal data uh, user pattern. And this is also the, the advantage of the one class uh, adversarial net. And in the very last minute, let me continue this LinkedIn story. Uh, I decided to use uh, or ask my most knowledgeable friend, uh, Google, to look up this Jacqueline. 
And I find out that, yes, this is a real person, but she is 80 years old now. And I'm afraid this is actually not a real person or uh, Jacqueline that, that email me. So the conversation continue. And then I just try to uh, uh, pro, uh, brush, him, brush her off by uh, copy and paste some of my LinkedIn profile to answer her question. And the very last thing of uh, her reply is saying, wow, cool. One minute later, after she replied this, and when I click on her profile, I got this. This profile is not available. I swear I did not report her, but I think maybe LinkedIn is also using some uh, AI algorithm to detect this uh, person is not the, the, the real Jacqueline Moss that is talking to me. But at the same time, maybe someone just report and LinkedIn took the action. And if you are not convinced AI, if you're still not convinced AI is the right way to do like a fraud, waste and abuse, at least one thing I want to tell you, that is for the uh, character that Leonardo plays, Frank Abenel, he is actually a real person. And but at the end of the story, and you will know that as well, he became FBI and serving uh, in, in FBI agent for more than 40 years. The, the whole story and the, the, uh, the goal behind why, why I'm telling you this is not all the bad guy has the opportunity to turn it to a good guy and help us to fight fraud, waste and abuse. If you are not doing that, yes, we know that we are talking about a topic of how to use AI to fight fraud, waste and abuse. But remember, on the other side of the world, then maybe another conference holding on right now to talk about how to use AI to conduct fraud, waste and abuse by some person. If we are not going to adopt it, your competitor will. And that's all uh, I want to talk about this today. And I know I'm running out of the time, but uh, please note down my LinkedIn and also my YouTube channel here because it's my goal to like uh, clean up all my code here in this talk and open source it in my GitHub and also in my YouTube channel so that you, have, you can have the hands-on of all the source code here and how did I do this supervised and, and supervised and also gain uh, network in fighting the fraud, waste and abuse.